The scripture reading for today is from the third chapter of Genesis. Often called the story of the fall, this is perhaps better thought of in modern terms as the story of a boundary violation. In any case, try to listen with fresh ears and hear the story anew today. Now, the snake was more discerning than all the other living things of the field that God had made. It said to the woman, Even though God said, You are not to eat from any of the trees in the garden, the woman interrupted and said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit in the other trees in the garden, but God said, You are not to eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. The snake said to the woman, Die, you will not die. Rather, God knows that on the day you eat from that tree, your eyes will be opened, and you will become like gods, knowing the reality of good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for eating, and, she, and that the eyes yearned for it, and, ate, and that the tree was to be coveted to fill one with understanding. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband beside her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Now they heard the sound of God walking about in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man said, and his wife hid themselves from the face of God among the trees of the garden. But God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I am naked, and so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you are naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be beside me, she gave me fruit from that tree, and I ate. Then God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The snake enticed me, so I ate. And to the woman, God said, I will multiply, yes, multiply your pain and labor. With pains you shall bear children. Toward your husband will be your yearning, yet he will rule over you. To the man, God said, Because you have followed the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You are not to eat from it, damned be the soil on your account. With painful labor shall you eat from it all the days of your life. Thorn and pricker bush will spring up for you, when you hope to eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat your bread until you return to the soil, for from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Thanks be to God for these words of life. Uh, when Grant was doing the announcements earlier and he was briefly at a loss for words uh, about what in the world we have been doing during the sermon series for the last uh, five weeks, um, I filled in the gap with the words, uh, clearing the swamp. Um, sometimes when you face a situation uh, where there are a great number of misunderstandings involved, it is important to try to clear out those misunderstandings before you can really build a constructive thesis um, that was often true in seminary classes where, I don't know, anywhere from half to three quarters, sometimes more, of the course was sort of like clearing the swamp of all the misconceptions that not everybody kind of just gets about Christianity or the Bible or theology or church history um, in the world today. And so that really is the nature of what this sermon series has been and indeed continues to be today. Um, and I have been reflecting about why that's the case. And um, for me, it's partly because I am working hard not to try to tell women what their experience of the faith is, uh, not having lived life as a woman, not being able to comment upon that. 
Um, but rather, we are sort of pointing toward those weeks in the future, beginning on July 14th, actually, when we'll have four women come and preach and reflect about their understanding of Scripture, the nature of their faith, their understanding of the Christian faith um, as a woman. And so this is kind of all leading somewhere, and I admit it might seem like a lot of clearing out the swamp, but um, given the... Uh, weight and depth and breadth of the patriarchy and the history of Christianity, uh, it probably is necessary for us to do this much clearing of the swamp. Um, that task, as I said, continues today uh, with this story that is typically called the fall. Um, although it is clear, if you actually read uh, past the third chapter of Genesis, that there is not one event in Scripture called the fall, but rather there is a there is a series of falls. Um, this story that we heard today with the violation, the boundary violation of eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, when Cain kills Abel, uh, when um, the, the the world sort of descends into a violent, a uh, chaotic state before God just kind of gives up, throws up God's hands and says, I need to start over. And that's where we get the story of uh, Noah's Ark, of course. Um, and then, unfortunately, it goes right back into it. Uh, the sons of Noah um, engage in unseemly behavior. And then you have um, uh, uh, Lace Laban, I believe it is, um, who um, sort of, sort of like um, shows the depths to which this spiral of the fallingness of humankind has come to. He shows the depths that it's come to when he says, "If someone puts out my eye, I'm going to kill them." If someone kills me, or if someone kills one of mine, I'm going to kill seven of theirs. And this escalation of violence as humanity just goes down and down, it's all part of what we call the fall. But um, this story, admittedly, does seem to have special place as the first instance of humanity not following the way of God in the world. And indeed, this is such a fascinating story. Uh, it says so much, and yet it says so little, at least so little that we would like to know. It is descriptive about what happened there in the Garden of Eden, but it's silent about the motivations and intentions of the characters involved. They say that one of the keys to good storytelling is to show it, not say it. Maybe you know that phrase, but in case you don't, if an author wants you to know that a character is sad, they should tell you, the author should tell you what the character did not what they thought or not what they were feeling. So when her friend died, she wept. Rather than when her friend died, she was sad and her heart was broken and she felt terrible or you know, whatever, however you want to describe that. The, the beauty of showing it rather than saying it, is that showing it is so much more evocative. Human actions and feelings and motivations and intentions are complicated. And she wept, describing what she did could lead in a million different directions, some of which may involve sadness, but some of which may not. Maybe she, as I have told this 
uh, example so far. Maybe she is an arrogant heart surgeon, and her friend was a patient on the operating table. And when they died, it meant that she failed to uh, um, finish the surgery properly, that she made a mistake, and she began to weep. She wept over being sued, possibly, for malpractice and losing her vacation home in the Caribbean. Well, this story from the third chapter of Genesis totally shows it rather than says it, which leaves a lot of room for the complexity of human actions and feelings and motivations and intentions. But that good storytelling uh, practice has not stopped people, especially male people throughout history, from declaring exactly what the story means. And for most of history, well, theological history at least, the meaning imposed on this story has been that it's all about pride or arrogance, you might say. The reason Eve first and then Adam, the reason they eat of the fruit of the tree is that they want to become like God's or more strongly even, they want to take the place of God. From St. Augustine in the 4th century to John Calvin in the 16th century to many pastors and theologians today, this story is about the will to power, the exertion of human will to rank higher as high as the gods in the order of creation, no matter the cost. It's all about pride, arrogance, the creature trying to take the place of the creator. But a few years ago, as women began to have more of a voice in how scripture is read, as women became theologians and on the faculty of seminaries and pastors and began to have their experience included rather than excluded in the conversation about what Scripture means, well, the reading of this story from Genesis got far more complicated, as it should be. It became clear that reading this story through the lens of pride, of wanting to become like God, and arrogance was a very masculine thing to do. Women like uh, Carol Gilligan, who used to teach at Harvard Divinity School, and Britta Gil Austern from Andover Newton Theological Seminary, they began doing interdisciplinary work, especially in women's studies, feminist studies, um, um, psychology and theology. And, and that whole area of work began to draw a distinction between different ways of understanding sin. Pride and arrogance, the desire to exert one's will and be godlike, is certainly one way to understand sin. But if sin is whatever we do that leads us away from God, and thus really away from our true selves, then sin can take a very different form as well. Not just pride or arrogance, but something else. It can take the form of an aimlessness, a, a negation of self, a denial of personal responsibility. In other words, sin, as that which alienates us from God and from our true selves, can take the form of an arrogant assertion of the self 
or it can take the form of sort of an aimless denial of self. And by the way, this sense that that which alienates us from God, can take different forms, is not simply limited to the notion of pride and arrogance. And it, this notion that it is not limited to pride and arrogance, this idea shows up in the UCC Statement of Faith that we read earlier during the baptism. There's one line in there that we recited. It says, seeking, uh, 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 talking about um, what God does for humanity. It says, you, God, seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. You seek in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and and sin. That statement was originally written in 1959 when the church had just begun listening to the voices of and paying attention to the experience of women. It was, that line, was an innovative theological concept in 1959 to talk about aimlessness theologically as something from which people needed to be saved. And it came from the experience, from the voices of women in the life of faith. Now, to be clear, both forms of sin, as arrogance and pride and as of aimlessness or, or self-denial, both forms of sin can be found in both men and women. Some men and some women display inordinate pride. And in all they do, they're seeking to control and influence and, 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 and seek power, trying to become like God. And some men and some women display an unwillingness to assert themselves at all. We have this phrase, to shrink back passively or aimlessly seeking to subordinate their own will to the will of others, not out of love, but out of an unwillingness or inability to take responsibility for their lives. Still, while there is nothing innate about this, our tradition has generally conceived of these things in gendered ways. To be masculine is to assert. To be feminine is to be passive. Men who are passive are thought to be effeminate. And women who are assertive are thought to be manly, but not in a good way. So what does this all mean for attempting to read the third chapter of Genesis with new eyes? Well, listen again to what the story says about what happened. The woman saw that the tree was good for eating and that the eyes yearned for it and that the tree was to be desired to fill one with understanding. So she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband beside her, and he ate. Now, if we can come at it with fresh eyes, there are so many different ways to read those lines. Perhaps the woman was worried about her life being without meaning. Perhaps she felt aimless and she wanted greater understanding of what life was all about. Perhaps she thought she had a duty to help her man partner succeed and grow. And she thought this tree would help her do that. Perhaps she wasn't aimless at all, nor was she subordinate to her husband, and 
She wanted to be like God. She was going to assert herself. The point is not exactly what the right interpretation is, but the point is that by narrowing the meaning to that last interpretation about pride and arrogance that we impose on this story a typically male interpretation. Women, then, don't see their struggles in this story. It becomes his story rather than her story or our story. Now, of course, one particularly patriarchal reading of the story supposes that God punishes, I don't know if any of you have ever heard this, but it certainly comes up, especially if you were raised in a more conservative theological church tradition. But one particularly patriarchal reading of the story supposes that God punishes Adam in the Garden of Eden because of the line in there that he listened to the voice of his wife. As if listening to the voice of your wife was a great sin for a man. He, the man, commits the horrible offense of sin of being subordinate to her, the woman. But this common reading warps the story. God punishes Adam not for listening to Eve's voice, but because Adam fails to heed the instructions that God directly communicated to him. Thus, when Adam attempts to pass responsibility off to Eve, remember, you probably know that line from the story, well, uh, she gave it to me. Well, God rejects that excuse. God says, have you eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat? In fact, the story itself treats Eve's sin as the reason that women are ruled by men in so much of human experience. Along with <laughs> how frighteningly painful childbirth is, so-called natural childbirth, as Grant put it last week, which indeed um, is a problematic phrase in and of itself, um, in addition to how frighteningly painful childbirth is, women are ruled by men because Eve ate of this fruit first and gave it to her husband. But, but what are we to make of that? I mean, the whole point of the story is that the cultural phenomenon of women being ruled by men is part of the problem. It's part of the fall, as we call it. That is the result of not doing things the way God intended. It's not part of the beauty of creation, the beauty that God has created for these two figures in the Garden of Eden. It's part of the way that we've messed things up. In fact, throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Exodus to Proverbs to Esther and so many other wonderful stories in the Bible— Listening to women is, more often than not, a good idea. It leads to good outcomes for God's people when they listen to women. And of course, those are the kind of themes that Jesus picks up on in the New Testament with his discipleship of equals with Jesus including women in his circle of followers, with Jesus healing women to cross boundaries when that would have been considered an inappropriate thing to do, 
to honor the women in the early church who had churches meeting in their own homes and were clearly women of means who could support such a gathering and lead the early church. When we discover more threads of Scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, then we are taught to pay attention to, we can see that women make a difference all along. We can see that sin itself is complex and diverse. It takes different forms. Yes, perhaps in women in certain ways and in men in certain ways. But all of it, all of that sin is part of the creation which we, as people who are doing God's work in the world, is seeking, are seeking to undo. We maintain the beauty of creation, and we work for the beauty of creation, and that includes honoring the experience of women and men, however it plays out in their lives. Aimlessness? Sin? Whatever it is, God works to overcome all of it through Jesus Christ and through the embodiment of his way in us now today. Thanks be to God. Amen.